All right, everybody, welcome back. I've gotten a ton of questions over my time on YouTube on exactly how stuff like flare resistance or radar guidance for missiles work. So I figured it would be a great time to go over the major aspects of missiles, how they're coded and how you can interpret them. This will not cover every minute detail or every missile, but important stuff for gameplay purposes. If you want to see more detailed stuff, I will have the GitHub link down in the description that actually has all the stats I'm pulling this from, or Jake makes great videos covering different families as well, which I would highly recommend you check out. He's actually the one that taught me most of this stuff as well. Before we get started though, what if I told you you could earn free Golden Eagles for that next vehicle stock grinder event? That's right, free Golden Eagles for War Thunder can help. Using the app, you can earn Golden Eagles for easy tasks such as surveys or games, or even just inviting your friends. Use my referral code 7KVGK to get an extra free 10 Golden Eagles from the start. So what are you waiting for? Download the app in the description below and start earning Golden Eagles today. So to start things off, let's begin with stuff that is universal for all missiles. So first things first, the stat card lies. The range at the top is the absolute maximum kinematic range, and that's from an aircraft going unrealistically high and fast. Think like Mach 2.2 at 15 kilometers. The speed is governed by the thrust and the present drag, more on that in a bit, and your missile will not actually hit the speeds on this stat card in a real match. The G limit is usually correct, but it can be a lie. Let me explain. Load factor max is the stat card G limit, but it's not actually connected to the real limiter on the missile. It's literally just for display. Rec Excel max is the true G limit, and while in most cases both are set to the same value, sometimes it's not. For example, the R511 is actually 15 Gs despite the stat car claiming 12. Additionally, just because that G limit is raised, it doesn't mean the missile will actually hit those Gs. A lot more goes into it, for example, the fin AOA and lift, and plenty of other stuff as well, including the current speed of the missile. This is why the AAM-3 is essentially just a longer range name than M, despite supposedly being 40 Gs. There wasn't enough changes to the other aspects of the missiles compared to the 9M to actually allow it to pull meaningfully more. I could set the 9L to 45 or 50 Gs right now and it would behave basically the same unless Gaijin also went ahead and changed the other values. Speaking of speed, this is mostly governed by the thrust and the drag of a missile. Your missile booster will be the time fire and force sections, where time fire is the time in seconds the booster burns for, and force, of course, is the force in newtons. If your missile has a sustainer, this will be time fire 1 and force 1. For example, the R27ER has a booster which burns for 3.2 seconds at 55,275 newtons, and a sustainer which burns for 4.8 seconds at 26,630 newtons. These fire sequentially, so the total burn time is 8 seconds. Drag is a bit more complicated and I won't get into all of it here, but the basic drag value is the CXK. This is only directly comparable to missile of the same caliber, as the caliber of the missile also affects drag. Generally though, of course, the lower the value the better. Guidance of a missile is another extremely complicated thing which I won't get into here, but there are a few values which are important and very easy to understand. So first of all, how long the missile takes after coming off the rail to actually start pulling. Now, most missiles have a timeout value, careful, the proximity fuse also has a timeout value as well, which controls how long it takes to fuse. And after that period of time, the missile begins to turn immediately. For example, the R60M takes 0.35 seconds while the Magic 2 takes 0.5 seconds. However, some missiles have what's called a time to gain value instead. This means it will ramp up from zero to its maximum Gs over whatever period of time the chart has. This is extremely noticeable with early radar missiles, such as the AIM-7E, which takes a whole 4.5 seconds to be able to reach its maximum pull. It starts out flying straight for 1.8 seconds before slowly ramping up to 40% of this pull at 2.5 seconds. Then from 2.5 seconds to 4.5 seconds after launch, it ramps from 40 to 100% of its pull. All missiles also have a track rate, which seems to affect how quick it can react to a target change in direction. But once it's above around 8 degrees, the returns diminish so quickly that in 99% of scenarios, you won't actually notice a difference. Getting into more IR specific stuff, the most important thing to note is how range bands work. So War Thunder's IR modeling is actually surprisingly good, and the seeker head behavior is governed by what's called range bands. This is the seeker head of the AIM-9L, and as you can see we have 5 range bands to work with. 
Keep in mind, all range values here are calibrated to the heat signature of a MiG-15 flying at Mach 0.8, so the actual distance can be much less or much greater depending on the heat output of an aircraft. This is more of a sensitivity gauge. Range band 0 is rear aspect heat, range band 1 is non afterburning all aspect heat, and range band 7 is afterburning all aspect heat. The most important thing here, aside from that, is range band 2, which is the sensitivity to the sun and to flares. The sun always wins, of course, but against flares, the missile can sometimes reacquire or even outright ignore flares. In the case of the 9L, it has equal preference for both flares and rear aspect heat, which is why the missile will sometimes reacquire and will almost always maintain lock if the enemy is afterburning. The R-73, Magic 2, and other advanced missiles actually prefer the plane over flares. Range Band 3 and 6 are IRCM and DIRCM, respectively, but those are basically a non-issue at this point, as only two aircraft have IRCM. The other major factor for a seeker is the field of view that it has. So this governs how much of the sky the missile can see, and a smaller field of view is generally better, as it means the missile is less likely to see flares and just to be decoyed in the first place. The combination of field and view and range band sensitivity is what actually governs flare resistance for the vast majority of IR missiles, with a few major exceptions. Also, some early missiles like the AIM-9B have a cage seeker, which means that it's locked straight ahead until after you launch, but most IR missiles in the game have an uncaged seeker which lets you lead the missile before you actually launch it. Many of those also have HMD and radar slaving, so you won't even have to manually lead the missile. You can just either radar lock them or point your mouse wherever you want to look at. A relatively new addition to the game are missiles with IRCCM, which are much more flare resistant than their predecessors. IRCCM comes in two flavors as of now, gate width and suspension. Both the 9M and the AAM-3 use suspension tracking, although in the case of the AAM-3 this appears to be a placeholder and it could be changed, but how this works is fairly straightforward. When it sees flares, it shuts off its eye for up to 3 seconds, or whenever the flares pass out of its seeker, whatever happens first. During this time, it cannot see what the plane is doing and is predicting your motion, meaning that to flare them you either need to confuse it with a flare flower or just drop flares and get out of the seeker before it turns itself back on. If you just turn and flare like is typical with stuff like the AIM-9L, it will remember where you're going and will easily destroy you. It's also extremely difficult to flare the side aspect as the flares are passing out of the field of view of the missile much more quickly compared to when they're just sitting in the line of sight of the plane, like you know front or rear aspect. This method is great for preventing people from accidentally flaring it, or for people that don't know how to flare it, but is relatively easy for experienced players to defeat. The other form of IRCCM is gate width, and what this says is that it shrinks down the field of view of the missile after guidance starts. For example, the R-73 may look like it has a bigger field of view than the aim l but after launch it shrinks down to only 0.75 degrees. Absolutely tiny, as you can see here. This means that while it is able to see and lock on to flares, once it gets close enough, at some point it actually cannot see flares. The aircraft takes up its entire field of view. The R-73 is typically more consistent than 9M from my experience, although this very much varies on how hot the aircraft are shooting at is. Generally though, once the R-73 gets to less than a kilometer of an aircraft, it is most likely unable to flare it, even front and side aspect in many cases. Future missiles can have even better IRCCM, such as combinations of both and even optical locking. One of these is the Python 4, which has Stinger IRCCM. Flareable, but very difficult. And it's already in the files. Coming up next, we have radar missiles, and I'm going to start with semi-active radar homing, which is the vast majority of missiles in the game right now. This, of course, builds on most of what we've already discussed, but you need to maintain a radar lock to have the missile actually hit the target at least in almost all cases, more on that in a bit. To start with, there are two types of seekers for radar missiles, pulse and CW or continuous wave. Pulse missiles are the more primitive and simply go for the largest radar signature and they have no regard for speed. This is why missiles such as the AIM-9C and the R-530F are just so easily decoyed. A single puff of chaff will immediately fool them, even if you have a lock on the actual target with your radar. Remember, once the missile is off the rail, it cannot communicate with the mother aircraft unless it has data link. CW missiles track based on the Doppler effect. Do so you know how the sound of a train changes as it passes you? A similar effect happens to radar waves, and CW missiles guide off of these waves. 
This is why missiles such as the Sparrow will ignore chaff, but it does require a large enough speed difference for the missile to recognize. If it falls below this, the missile will switch to the chaff as it prevents a larger radar signature and has a similar closure rate. This is also why you'll see radar missiles switch target. The other target was simply going faster and there was more of a speed difference for the missile to pick up on. The Seekers currently have equal values for RCS on all targets, but the range of course does vary by missile. Another thing that varies on missile are the settings for that Doppler speed gate, with the R27R and ER being the most difficult to fool. One interesting thing with extremely late SARS like the R27ER is that they have data link built into the missile, in addition to the normal seeker. This means that even though the seeker is worse than the 7M in terms of range and can only see up to 25 kilometers, the missile can still be shot for much further. Data link cannot provide enough information to accurately hit a target, but it keeps it close enough until the seeker can actually pick the target up. The data link also allows you to break lock and relock the target later, which can provide an element of surprise. Inertial navigation will also keep guiding the missile to the last known location of a plane, so in some cases, missiles can still hit even after radar lock has been broken for a few seconds. This requires the target to continue flying on the same course though. Active missiles, currently only the Phoenix, but in the next couple patches we should be getting other ones as well, have their own seeker built in. So they guide off of data link until they get within range for their own seekers to take over. In the case of the Phoenix, this takes place up to 16 kilometers from the target. Although it's preferred to keep your TWS guiding the missile in, sometimes you're just unable to. That's where another important setting comes in, inertial navigation drift. In the case of the Phoenix, this is the only notable upgrade going from the AIM-54A to the AIM-54C, is that it has much less drift while it's on inertial navigation. So this means that it's much more accurate if you are unable to get it all the way in. Radar missiles also have a couple unique guidance modes compared to IR. One of the more interesting ones is time to hit to gain. Essentially what this says is restrict how hard a missile can pull, not just on time out from the firing aircraft, but also on how long it will be until it reaches the enemy. This is mostly useful at long range, such as if you're trying BVR, as it stops a missile from pulling very hard and bleeding tons of speed while it's still far away from the target. For example, the R27ER is limited to 30% of its pull if it's 60 seconds away, and then scales up until it gains full pull when less than 5 seconds away. Finally, we have lofting. What this does is allow a missile to climb into thinner air to extend its range. Currently, the Phoenix is the only missile which can do this, and it will do so if the target is at sufficient range. It will loft up to 17.5 degrees before arcing back down on the target. If we ever get the Navy Sparrows like the AIM-7P for the F-18 and the F-14, those do also have lofting, but regardless, the AMRAM will definitely have lofting for sure, and pretty much every missile that we get going for will also have that. Eventually, you know, whenever we have the AIM-9X Block II and the Python 5, those also loft to gain extra range. That about wraps it up for the video. I know there was a lot of information to go over right there, but this is some pretty interesting stuff and explains a lot about how the missiles work. If you like this and you'd like to see more, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I'll catch y'all next time. So, peace, y'all.